Hi. Last spring, as I was compiling research and articles on resumes and cover letters, I came across an article from a business owner who said he hated resumes, he never required resumes, he thought they were obsolete, that he felt like he could get a much better sense of who people are by sitting across the desk from them than by reading a resume, which he felt like most people padded or only showed their best selves. And he said, yeah, that's not super useful to me. And on the one hand, I agree with him that we do definitely get a better sense of who people are when we can have this back and forth conversation than we do when all the information is on a piece of paper. And that might work if he has a small company and there are only five applicants for a job or 10, or if he doesn't mind a lot of work, 20, but what if there are 50? What if there are 100? What if he has a large company and he's hiring or expanding? How does he narrow down the applicants? How does he qualify them and make sure that he's only interviewing the best applicants? And that's where the resume and cover letter come in. So to be honest, I never created my own resume until I was in my 40s. I got jobs because I knew people and they offered me jobs. They knew I had an English degree. They knew I was well read and could research. And so people just asked me, have you ever thought about working for me? And that's how I got jobs. Um, they weren't really well paying jobs with a lot of advancement, but at the time I didn't mind. And so I never needed a resume. But once I started teaching, I needed a way to communicate who I was to people I hadn't met so that I could have jobs that I might not be able to get otherwise. Let's talk about resumes and cover letters. I'd like for you to think about a resume and a cover letter as an argument. It's basically an argument about why an employer should hire you specifically, or at the very least, ask you in for an interview. And your argument goes something like this. You are arguing that based on all the things that you have done in the past, you are the person that the employer is describing in the posting. That posting is there because that's the kind of person they are looking for, the type of person who can do this particular job, and they know who they want. And you're arguing based on all the things that I've done, I am that person. So I want you to think about this argument. This argument is not just about talking about yourself and how great you are, but showing the employer that you're the person that you're looking for, who can step in and fill the need that they describe in the posting. So in a way, you are writing this argument with the organization's needs in mind <clears throat> not your own. When I've reviewed resumes in the past and cover letters, I've been, I haven't been very interested in the ones that say, you should hire me because I need a job. No, I want to hire the people who are, who can do the jobs that we're hiring for. I'm more interested in our needs as an employer, as an organization, than I am in the needs of the applicant. And so you need to craft your argument that shows that you are interested in the organization's needs. In this way, your resume and your cover letter are all about shaping your identity, showing you are the person that the organization is looking for. In this argument, you are responding to a specific rhetorical situation. That is the resume and the cover letter. 
And at this point, you've found one, you've posted it to Canvas, this is a job you qualify for, and the posting has a lot of details in it. It has a job description, it has the name of the organization, it has job qualifications, it has job duties, it has everything you need in order to craft your identity. Now, as I'm saying this, you might say, whoa, I don't think I actually qualify for that job yet. Or I don't think I qualify enough that I can actually show that I've met all the needs of that organization. And you can change your posting in order to prove your, improve your grade on this project. But if you change your posting, I have to get a copy of the new job posting because I read the job posting as I'm giving you feedback on your resume and cover letter, and you'll lose the five points that you earned for the job posting because it will be in late. Yeah. Um, but it'll be worth it because 20% of your score for the resume is on how well you respond to the job posting. So let's talk about what a resume is like. And I will say it would be really nice if there were a single way to create a resume, as if experts agreed on everything related to resumes. But there's not a single way, and experts do not agree. However, this is an assignment with grading criteria. It's an exercise to help you develop skills. And so I might ask you to do some things that in previous classes you've taken, um, the professor said, never do that. Or you have a friend who works in HR and says, meh, we don't need that. I've gathered a lot of research and this is an assignment. So you're gonna include all the required elements. And later on, when you're actually applying for jobs, you can choose to use those elements or not. But it's just an exercise to help you develop skills. Um, what are the grading categories? Um, visual appearance, organization, response to the posting, you need a heading, you need a professional summary, and this is not on the bulleted list, but you need to have your education. You also need evidence, um, skills, experiences, and bulleted duties. And I also grade on grammar and editing. Now, what do experts agree applicants should do? They agree that you should create a unique resume for every application, that you should customize your resume according to the posting. Don't just send out the same resume to every job you apply for. Make yourself stand out by showing that you're the person that the organization wants and make it easy for readers to skim that resume and get all the information. In other words, appearances count. Um, researchers have learned that a HR person spends approximately six seconds reading each resume. They skim it, and if the person looks like they might be the person they're looking for, they set it in the side that, hey, we might interview this person. And then if it's not, they dump it in the trash. So even though this is just an exercise, I want you to approach it as if you're crafting job materials. You're making an evidence-based argument that you're a good fit for this particular job, as well as for the particular company. That's why I asked you to do research on the company and their culture, um, and that you can contribute to or fill their specific needs in ways other applicants might not be able to do. That means you are paying attention to the details of that posting and you're crafting your experiences in a way that directly corresponds to what the position announcement is asking for. This is an E. Shelley Reed assignment. 
you know, like we think of E. Shelley Reed with the creative assignments, but actually her 10 ways to think about writing are relevant no matter what kind of writing you're doing. Write about what you know about or curious about or passionate about. You should be interested in this job. You should know your experiences. You should know this resume. Show, don't tell. Don't be general. Be specific. Be detail oriented. Um, adapt to the audience and the purpose you're writing for. She says, when we write this way, we write rhetorically. That is, we're paying a need attention to the needs of the author and the needs of the reader rather than the needs of the teacher or the rules in the textbook. Yes, there's a teacher in this exercise. That's me. And yes, there's a grader. But I've done enough research that I know what employers are looking for. I have friends in HR. I do research. I read business books. I have a stack of books on resumes. And um, I pass all this on to you so that you can include it, so that you're aware, so that you can pay attention, hypothetically at least, to the needs of the employer in the posting. Now, in order to achieve this purpose, you need to consider your reader's characteristics their situation, their goals, know about that company, find out as much as you can about them, uh, and repeatedly use that information to choose the most effective way to handle every detail of your communication. Um, use that information to consider what will be persuasive and usable in your reader's eyes. You'll know the organization and you know the posting. And you craft your, you make your rhetorical decisions based on that. Now, this is SendGrid. This is an organization, and uh, they do mass email mailings. And if we're talking about culture, this is their values, happy, humble, hungry, honest. Here's a picture of them from their website, drinking beer, on a catamaran, shoes off, they are young, they are hip, they are fun. They are happy, humble, hungry, and honest. Um, I wanted to update it and find some more about SendGrid, and I found out that in 2018, Twilio purchased SendGrid for $2 billion in stock options. The new website, the vibe is totally different. Compare this culture to this culture. These people are dressed corporately. Now, yes, they might go on boats sometimes, and these people might dress corporately sometimes, but this is their website to show this is who we are. And so you can see that the Twilio leadership team and board of directors is highlighting their years of experience in communication and software and their corporate expertise versus the fun, humble, hungry, honest. Um, here's some more pages from SendGrid. Um, not send, um, this is from Twilio. This is how they communicate who they are. Um, remember the hungry, honest, humble, and one more H? These are their values. Be an owner, empower others, no shenanigans, rudely private or prioritize, write it down, be bold, be inclusive, draw the owl, whatever that is, don't settle entirely different culture. And I think that it's important. The way you apply to SendGrid might be different than Twilio. The job's the same. But you might include some activities. You might communicate your experiences, your internships. It might be different. Now, 
the rough draft for your resume and cover letter are due on Thursday so that I can get them back to you on time for you to revise in week six. Um, I've got a couple of pages for you that have details about my expectations for the resume and those expectations reflect the conventions and the best practices that I've been collecting for years now in order to communicate to my students. All right, that's all I've got. You can get started. Bye-bye.